Hi, welcome everybody. Um, we're just going to give it a few seconds to allow more people to trickle in before we begin. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, so welcome to the webinar. Um, this is When the World Comes to Your Community, Tips for Reporting on the Local Impacts of International Trade. Um, so I'm at the Shorenstein Center, I'm the events coordinator, and I'm going to briefly introduce our three panelists and moderator. Um, so we have Michael Klein, who is the William L. Clayton Professor of International Economic Affairs at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, and he's the executive editor of EconoFact. He served as the chief economist in the Office of International Affairs of the United States Department of the Treasury from 2010 to 2011. He is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Then we have Katie Russ, um, she has expertise in open economy, macroeconomics, and international trade policy. She is a faculty research associate in the National Bureau of Economic Research, International Trade and Investment Group, and co-organizer of the International Trade and Macroeconomics Working Group. Um, and then lastly, we have Martha Mendoza, who is a Pulitzer Prize winning national writer for the Associated Press and journalist who provides breaking news, features, and investigative reporting from around the world. She has worked with AP colleagues focusing on immigration, human trafficking, and cybersecurity. Um, and then lastly, our moderator today is Clark, and Clark Merrifield is a senior editor for economics and legal systems at the Journalist Resource here at the Shorenstein Center. Um, so I'm now going to turn it over to Clark. Caroline, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being here and uh, spending this hour with us. We have a lot to get to, so we're going to jump in. And um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A as we go along, and we'll monitor that and get to uh, as many of them as we can. Uh, Michael, you're our EconoFest, uh, EconoFact co-host here, so we'll start with you. Um, maybe you can just sort of give us a, a big picture view of what we often call the winners and losers of trade. These are also called the benefits and costs. As journalists, we often want to tell the whole story. So that includes uh, talking about the people and the groups that bear the costs. So uh, when it comes to U.S. consumers, companies, workers, who tends to benefit from trade? And then who are those that are often dis displaced by, by trade? Well, thank you, Clark. And it's a pleasure to be here um, with my friend Katie and with Martha and you. Um, the advantages of free trade are, those advantages are some of the oldest ideas in economics going back to the early 19th century. So David Hume, the, uh, the Scottish economist wrote about this, but even back then he recognized that there were winners and losers from trade. The winners from trade for the country is, are, is the country as a whole, but of course, some people do better and some people do worse. So people who have the opportunity to purchase more goods and services, a wider range at cheaper prices tend to be the winners. And people who lose their jobs because of international competition tend to be the losers. So that's sort of the simplest way of thinking about it. And within that context, the benefits seem to be more diffuse, like you might pay $5 less for a shirt, but then the costs are much more concentrated. Somebody loses his or her job. But it's more subtle than that as well. And you know, Katie will probably speak to this because she's done really important work about it. For example, if you are um, working in a washing machine plant, you're making washing machines, and there are uh, tariffs, taxes put on imported steel, then that's not going to um, that's going to hurt you, because there are, you're, the washing machines that you're going to sell are much more expensive. So I'll let Katie talk about the very interesting and important work that she's done along those lines. And I would just mention one other thing as well: that trade is only one of many sources of change in a dynamic economy, and it's often the case that trade is blamed 
for things that have nothing to do with trade. So for example, automation is a really important part of um, what's been going on in the economy. So going back to the example of steel, if you looked at a steel plant 50 or 60 years ago, and you looked at one today, you'd really be struck by how few people are working in steel plants today as compared to 50 or 60 years ago. So trade is one element of the dynamism and change in the economy, which has both good and bad aspects. And some people benefit and some people are hurt, but there are a range of other ones as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Katie, you've studied the effects of the 2018 steel tariffs, which uh, were part of the quote unquote Trump tariffs, which got a lot of press at the time, but the Biden administration has kept many of them in place and they, the steel ones, as far as I know, are, are still, still there. Um, what has your uh, research found in terms of the effects on jobs and uh, pay here? So um, for Econofact, right before the tariffs went into place, what Lydia Cox and I, so Lydia is a uh, uh, PhD economist, she's at Yale right now and will take a permanent position at University of Wisconsin soon. But what we did is look at, um, okay, how many jobs in the United States are involved in industries that use steel? And when you look at the number of jobs in steel using industries uh, compared to the number of jobs in steel production, the ratio is 80 to 1. Then if we look at the work of researchers who have done very careful uh, micro level analysis to determine, okay, where do we see jobs missing or disappearing? Um, following the tariffs that we can directly correlate to industries that are using uh, these inputs. Uh, so there's a wonderful study by Aaron Flynn and Justin Pierce from the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and they find it's about 75,000 uh, steel using manufacturing jobs that are just not there, that would have been there would have either grown or not been eliminated um, due to the imposition of these tariffs. Now, what's going on with those right now? Uh, so there's the, the Biden administration has chosen to leave a significant amount of protection um, in place on these metals. So what they've done is convert the tariffs to quotas for some uh, some countries. And um, I think a lot of people aren't, they, they may not be quite clear, okay, what does it mean if you put it in place, a, put in place a quota? Because, you know, a tariff is pretty straightforward to understand. It's a tax, right? It's a tax that is levied on goods as they come into the United States. And whoever's importing the good pays that tax. Now, sometimes the importer can negotiate a better deal with the foreign supplier because the foreign supplier knows that people are going to be you know averse to paying these high taxes on their goods so they might sort of you know bargain and the incidence of the tariff might be split and in fact that's what we did see on steel um in this the case of these tariffs so that it was split more or less in half um but um but in, in general like the the importer the importers paying that nominal that nominal tax it's slapped on the um on the the bill when the good crosses the border a quota is something really interesting <laughs> because a quota means that a country has agreed it will not export more than a certain amount to the united states and then anything it exports above that will be subject to a big tariff mm. so the quota is interesting because all right if you think about tariffs it, it's really distortionary to economic activity and raises the cost of inputs, which, you know, as um, the Flan and Pierce study showed, will reduce, um, will re reduce, it can reduce hiring and investment. But a, uh, the, the, the cost of the tariff goes into government coffers because it is a tax. So it goes into the U.S. Treasury. With the quota, it's quite different. So with the quota, the suppliers restricting the amount it's exporting. And when you hold back supply, you know, we've all seen with the supply shortage, what that does to prices, right? <laughs> so it drives up prices. So it's th that that margin, which could be a tariff, 
um, now is converted to what we call quota rents <laughs> in economics. So it's this extra margin in the form of higher prices because there's restricted supply, but it goes to the suppliers because they're receiving a higher price for their good. So I think that's one reason why some countries have been reluctantly willing to replace the quota protection, the tariff protection with quota protection. It's still a protectionist measure. It's still a trade barrier. Uh, it still means higher costs of inputs for US users of these goods, but it's a little bit more beneficial to the exporting countries than uh, a tariff would be. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking of the the con effect piece that you wrote, uh, which I put in the chat, and I hope the folks will go and read it when we're done here. Um, but you touch on this, I think, in the uh, first paragraph to it, and I'm thinking of my supply and demand charts, and I apologize if anyone is having like Econ 101 flash, flashbacks here, but the the way, the, the stated way, uh, as I understand it, that it's supposed to work is that a tariff is supposed to increase the domestic supply of the good uh, that is it's supposed to move production back home so to speak and increase jobs here but the research has found that jobs have actually gone down what's do we do we know why so the tariff the tariff makes the cost of a foreign version of a good higher inside mm -hmm. the united states and so by keeping that price of the foreign goods elevated, it allows domestic producers to charge a higher price and therefore um, cushions their profit margins. Um, people talk about the example of Harley Davidson in the 1980s. So uh, kind of emergency tariff uh, was put on motorcycles at the time. There's some debate over exactly what effect it had, but the idea was to give Harley, Harley Davidson a little bit of breathing space in the face of a sudden onslaught of competition from other countries that had lower wages or lower cost of production so that Harley Davidson could have some time to kind of reorganize and adapt to that. And in fact, the tariffs were taken off ahead of time. Um, compared to, you know, they, they, they weren't left in place as long as originally intended. So some people say they were successful. Some people say they didn't matter. Harley Davidson just adapted anyway. It's, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of a debate. Um, so, the, but the idea is that this, the tariffs make these foreign goods more expensive and that cushions domestic profit margins. Um, so that's the basic idea. Now, jobs in the steel, in steel production, at least at the time of the, um, writing of the Flan and Pierce paper, there was no statistically observable increase in uh, those jobs. And then if you just look at the, and they did the very careful statistical analysis. Um, there's a confidence interval. It could have been up to 5,000, but it was a statistical zero. If you just looked at when we wrote that piece at the um, you know, what were steel jobs before the tariffs, what were steel jobs when we wrote the piece, then it looked like there were about a thousand more jobs. So if you think about 75,000 jobs lost, a thousand extra jobs there, and that's within that Flan and Pierce confidence interval, then, uh, you know, that's, that, that matches up so shockingly closely to that original, um, you know, ratio of uh, 80 to one still using mm -hmm. to uh, still producing jobs. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't there been more investment? I, I think there's been a transformation in the way that we manufacture steel. It just doesn't take as, um, or more hiring. Yes, why hasn't there been more hiring? They're just, we just, don't use as as many workers when producing steel anymore. There there are different kinds of technologies used, and that's um, I think that's that we're seeing that with a lot of different industries. There's a wonderful New York Times uh, when they used to have the fashion section. You know, there's a wonderful New York Times article called "The Sock Queen of Alabama," and mm -hmm. it talks about this town in Alabama that used to be dominated by sock production. Like everybody was working in the sock manufacturing plants. And then that, you know, how the town was just decimated when that industry uh, left because of, um, uh, well, it was associated with import competition. And sock manufacturing is coming back in that town now uh, with the daughter of former workers in one of the, um, the sock manufacturing plants, but it's coming back at a much smaller scale and very specialized. So using very high tech machines that can produce uh, customized 
socks, um, you know, by order, and the machines are imported from uh, Europe, and they're it's a it's a whole different thing. You just don't need as many workers to produce a certain number of socks like you used to. Yeah, great. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you, Katie. Um, Martha, I want to get you in here as well. Uh, you've done some incredible work, truly, and uh, I'm I'm going to put some links to your stuff in the chat as well. Uh, and I really encourage people to go read it um, when we're done here, if you have not yet. Um, but you've investigated what I like to think of as the other side of the trade ledger of what happens when there's huge demand for a product such as like shrimp or or fish. Um, a, a seemingly world away from the people who demand it. Um, and there are some real effects on labor issues in these places. Uh, can you just talk a bit about your work and what what you've you found? Sure. It's it's funny when I when I started getting into like supply chain reporting, which is what we call it. I realized that people who work in supply chains don't think about it at all the way we were thinking about it. Um, if there was a fire in a denim factory in India we would be looking at what labels were on those blue jeans that ended up, you know, if, if a bunch of people died, like who in a sweatshop, who whose jeans were they making so that a consumer in the United States might go to a store and be like, hmm, this label is the brand that they made in that factory where they all burned it down. With the um, seafood, we became interested in um, people who would run away from boats in Southeast Asia and describe having been enslaved on those boats. And we decided to not only find people who were enslaved, but then because that is a story of, of human trafficking and labor abuse in particularly in Asia, also Africa, which is reported on and there's a not very much action at this end. And so we began meticulously tracking those products back to the United States. Um, we use um, our own surveillance, like following trucks when they come into a port. We use some tools I'll be sharing with you today where you can track imports. Um, and we use a lot of knocking on doors. And we are we work closely with our lawyers to identify kind of, you can never say this particular fish was caught by this person. Although since our reporting, there have been efforts to do just that barcode, mm. the fish at the catch. Mm. Um, but but what we can say is that once it enters that warehouse, once a, something produced by somebody who's working in an enslaved position enters that warehouse, everything in that warehouse is tainted. Right. And then what what happens to late, you know, like part of the response for people in wealthier countries might just be, well, I, I, I don't I don't know what to do other than not buy these goods. Uh, what happens when demand dries up? Do labor conditions get better? No, not necessarily at all. So, for example, if there is a boycott of a particular product, even a, something like palm oil, where there's a lot of really treacherous situations for the people who are harvesting it, but if if therefore there's a boycott and then they don't have any work, they don't have any food, it's also the place where they're living and it can become more desperate. And so it needs to be a multi-layered solution um, that some, some of the advocacy groups really do create where you're providing healthier jobs, safer work environments, and a real commitment to um, doing better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Michael, I wanted to go back to something that we were chatting about a couple of days ago. Uh, a colleague of mine was asking, um, you know, if if jobs uh, disappear uh, or decline because of certain trade policies uh, on the local level, what what happens? Do property taxes go away? D does this then lead to like less funding for schools and police and fire and all these things? And you started to talk about your experience growing up in Gloversville, where they don't make gloves anymore. Um, do you want to share share that story? Sure. Um... So I grew up in a, basically a mill town in upstate New York called Gloversville, which is 40 miles west of the Adirondacks. My dad worked in a tannery. And there was, you know, in, in economics, we think about comparative advantage. So there is a comparative advantage for, um, for uh, tanning and glove making in this town 
because there are a lot of dairy farms in the area. There's a lot of fresh water, which is needed for tanning and so on. And it also, um, the town was sort of heavily Italian um, because there's sort of a tradition uh, among Italian immigrants of working, making sort of these very fine gloves. You know, the, the saying fits like a glove comes from the fact that women used to wear these, you know, these gloves for very high fashion. And when I, um, we left the town in 1974, at that time, the town had about 25,000 uh, people in it. Now it has about 15,000. I remember as a kid, maybe this is, you know, sort of a good indication of why I became an economist. My father coming home from the tannery and saying, we're starting to, um, the United States is starting to import leather from Brazil. And, you know, that's going to be a real problem. But there are other problems as well. So one thing that happened was that women stopped wearing gloves like that. And as a consequence, you know, the demand for these expensive, beautiful gloves fell off dramatically. Um, a lot of jobs moved not out of necessarily um, out of upstate New York to foreign countries, but from upstate New York to the South. There, um, as I understand it, as you know, 14 year old or something, there was also this problem that the um, town elders in their wisdom vetoed the possibility of a train spur going from um, where the New York State Thruway went about 15 miles south up until the town. Um, so, you know, this is a, a multifaceted story. It's a story of infrastructure. It's a story of demand and taste. Um, it's also a story of international competition, perhaps. Um, but, you know, what happened is now the town is pretty desperately poor. Um, mm -hmm. I was there a number of years ago, and along the main street, you know, every few houses are shuttered, or every few stores are shuttered. Um, this is the same town that the novelist Richard Russo comes from, mm -hmm. and he writes very movingly about these sort of post-industrial towns and um, books like Bridge of Sighs or um, Empire Falls, which actually takes place in Maine, but, you know, it's sort of a similar kind of thing. So I'd actually like to turn it over to Katie because she's done really important work with a friend and colleague of ours, Jay Shamba, on what determines whether a town recovers or not from um, sort of having this kind of a shock. And uh, Jay and Katie have sort of uncovered some evidence of what seems to suggest a town is more liable to sort of survive this or not. And we talked about it in a podcast episode that we did for Econofact, but Katie, maybe you'd like to pick up on that and draw on the research that you did. Oh, thank you, Michael. Um, and thanks for that story. Wow. And we see a similar story in Endicott, New York, you know, with the uh, Endicott Johnson Shoe Factory uh, moving through and then, you know, down um, toward the Ohio River Valley and then off to um, lower wage countries. Um, and then IBM coming in until there was the advent of the PC, which was easier to uh, offshore and um, or uh, produce abroad by, by new companies. So um, this product cycle that uh, Michael's describing with products spawning in an, a highly innovative area with lots of specialists, engineers, uh, specialized materials available and so forth, uh, and then moving into areas with lower wages um, as the production process standardizes um, and then off to other countries with um, lower wages. Like, this is a phenomenon that we see across the 20th century. So it's not something that just happened in the 80s and 90s, for instance. It's 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 it takes place over centuries. And what um, I saw in the work with uh, Jay Shamba and Catherine Erickson and Min Fei Xu, uh, we were really curious. You know, what places had the toughest effects from the import competition from China, what places were able to absorb the shock and not leave with big adverse impacts on their labor market, like separation from the labor force or unemployment. And what we found is that there, there were two factors which could, ex, which could largely explain 
the overall impact of the China shock on the labor markets. So would absorb the significance is what we call it. So if we just unpack that that famous result from the China shock literature by Otter Dorn and Hansen, um, you know, it, it's really robust. You, can, you can't overturn that thing, <laughs> but just unpacking it to see, okay, what are the characteristics of the places that did, you know, they were, they served they made it through unscathed versus places that made it through with scars. And the places that made it through with the bigger scars were places that had a uh, lower overall level of education among their workforce. So lower levels of high school um, completion or four-year degrees. Um, and in addition, and this is what we were surprised, we actually saw that, okay, so the China shock started in 1990. But we saw that places where industries already had been moving out between 1960 and 1980, those places also tended to be the hardest hit. So if you're a place where industry is already moving out, like the places in upstate New York that Michael um, and I were talking about, and plus you're a place that doesn't have a highly educated workforce, it was really hard for those places to absorb the displacement of workers that came about from the import competition. Now, Teresa Fort and different groups of co-authors, um, she's got some wonderful research and also uh, Nick Bloom, uh, Phil Luck, Kyle Handley, and um, some others, they have some wonderful research showing, okay, well, in the places where firms were doing well, you know, why were they doing well? And they tended to be firms that were in these places with, they call it levels, high levels of human capital. But um, I mean, we, we, we just look at levels of education in the workforce. And so those firms in those places were able to innovate away from the shock. They were able to move into new industries and explore new opportunities. Um, but places that, uh, firms that were in places with maybe less opportunities to innovate away, um, they, you know, those places had a harder time absorbing the shock and ended up with bigger impacts on unemployment so um, and more separation from the workforce. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Martha, I, I also wanted to hear your story about bike, bike production where you are. I think there's a good uh, sort of way for people to think about how to localize these international trade stories in the what's going on with bike production where you are. Do you want to talk about that? Definitely. I mean, I think no matter what town you're in, if you're a journalist, you can begin doing international trade stories if you're not already doing them based on the imports coming into your community. And so using some of the tools I'll show you guys in a second. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at what's what are we have this bike industry booming around us, many bike manufacturers in my community um, making bike forks and bike cranks and bicycle frames and all kinds of e-bikes and everything. And so I just was able to look and see, oh, all of this is coming from Taiwan or China, all of the parts they're putting. And basically what they're doing is putting bikes together here that are made in China. And um, you know, with colleagues, the next step, if I was doing a local story, would be to see if I could get a Chinese journalism student or a Chinese journalist to team up with me and together do a shared story. And this is something the Global Investigative Journalism Network does a lot of like if you're in your community and you're like, Ooh, I want to team up with somebody in any other country, they can help you make that network. Um, and 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 you can pair up with somebody in another country to see what are the labor conditions in that factory making these ten thousand dollar mountain bikes. And um, Clark, is it cool if I if I share my screen and just show some of those tools for a couple? Yeah, let's okay. let's get into okay. that. Yeah, um, Bertha's going to do a little uh, show and tell for us here, which I think is is going to be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, share screen. Sharing. Oh, and this was a, a really, this was an article that um, Liz just shared that goes back to tanneries, my, where we found mm -hmm. tanneries in Hazarabag, which is one of the most polluted places on the planet, making doing business for Clark's coach, Kate Spade, Macy's, Michael Kors, Sears, Steve Madden, Timberland. And I bet some of those companies way back in the day, if they were there, would have been working out of Gloversville. So here's the tool that I was going to show you. Um, it's Import Genius. There's other ones that compete like this. The concept is when you go to the post office and mail something out of the country, if any of you have done that, 
you fill out a custom bill of lading or a little piece of paper, all of that data of everything leaving the country and coming into the country, every single item um, is compiled by these companies. And you can either buy accounts or sometimes they will grant you, if you're a journalist, some free searching to find out what's coming and going. And we use this for a lot of stories. And just for purposes here, let's say you were looking at ammunition coming into, so I'm looking at an import. I'm just gonna use this in all the fields. So if the company's name is ammunition, but I could choose it as a product, um, but I'm just gonna keep it for all the fields because it's a pretty unique name. You can set your date range. And so a lot of times we'll do searching over time so I can compare for example, the year, the, the first year of COVID, I would compare versus the year before looking at N95 mask imports. And then the next year on top of that to show how they're coming in and where they're coming from. Um, I have currently looking at import, but I also can do export data. And with this tool, you can look at a number of countries. Um, so just looking something simple, like where is ammunition coming in from? Um, I get a list of these shipments, the most recent being two days ago, um, but going, and, and I can see from each of these what it is, the consignee, the shipper, the arrival date, how much of it came, what port it went out of. Um, you can see vessels if you want to track vessels, which is another thing we will use something called marine traffic to track vessels themselves. Um, and then the address that it came from and the address that it left from. So um, you can see there's lots and lots of companies importing ammunition. I was looking at this one of a shipment of military ammunition, April 6th, and you can also see shipment details here. So a lot of military ammunition was shipped to Olin Winchester in East Alton, Illinois, from this company here, Namo Vanas Verkin. And you can then see how many shipments are coming from this company or how much is going to Olin Winchester. Let's say you work for the East Alton, Illinois Telegram newspaper. Mm. You might want to do a search of Olin Winchester. Um, and then you can see all the shipments, one, two, three, arriving two days ago, which is usually about as recent as this is. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see kind of exactly what, what it is that they're importing. These are hunting ammunition, and they're coming from all different places. This is not that same company we saw earlier. Um, and you can see the name of the company. So you can see how you can get very in the weeds and have quite a bit of fun doing this. Um, mm -hmm. Let's say you want to know where Olin, is Olin Winchester then selling stuff to the U.S. government? And this, I'm only going to show you two sites today, or just, this is the second one. So this is a federal procurement data system. There is a, a summary site of this called usaspending.gov, but it is not as specific and not as helpful. So I would just, this is going to show us all the federal contracts, what the federal government is buying. And um, so I just put in Olin Winchester to see is the federal government buying ammo from Olin Winchester. And I always, when I use this tool, I sort it by date signed because um, I like to see things that are most recent. So here is, you can see which departments, which agencies are getting am probably ammunition from Olin which would be the National Park Service, Federal mm -hmm. Crime Enforcement Network, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the Marshal Service. And this is very weedy, and I'm sorry, but if you click on this little view, you can get a look at more details about this contract, how much money, the mm -hmm. dates. Um, and if you want to do a Freedom of Information Act, you have the contract number. Um, and if you are patient with this, you can see nine millimeter Winchester ammunition. So you can see very specifically what it was. Um, for the broader crunching of this data, yes, use USA spending and you can kind of see trends and um, year on year data. So where, where, where would you go from here? Say you're covering East Alton and uh, you see all these shipments, you know, I, I 
Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean anything nefarious is going on, but who who would you turn to next to kind of figure out what this all means? Well, I would spend a lot of time. Unfortunately, this isn't clean data. So I would get I would export this to a spreadsheet and I would clean it up. And then I would start looking at some um, trends and patterns. Are they getting most of their ammunition? For, are they getting any from Russia? Because that's illegal right now. Um, are they getting most of it from Brazil? Were they getting it from Russia prior to the, sorry, Katie and Michael, um, the, the sanctions or the tariffs? I think it was sanctions. <laughs> um, yeah. So were they getting it from Russia and have they shifted their imports? Um, uh, uh, and then I would, you know, if I could see if I could find out more about some of these um, shippers, some of the companies that are sending it out. Um, this just looks like steel, perhaps. So th there's not necessarily a gotcha at all, but it mm -hmm. could be very interesting to even just say, hey, our local company that was Russia dependent um, has had to shift or this our local company was not impacted by these sanctions. And in fact, Russia is not very much impacted by these ammo sanctions. It's kind of a in name only sanction. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm projecting. I don't know that that's true, but I, I kind of imagine that Russia's economy is going to not be knocked down by not selling ammo. Um, so. And 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 your understanding is that for Import Genius, if you're a journalist, you can get some free access to these data? That has been my experience. Okay. Um, there's a second service called Pangeva, um, mm. which actually has a more beautiful interface, but it is more expensive. Um, and so Pangeva it was, I think, purchased by S&P Global and their data has, like I say, it's more, it's a nicer um, layout, but it does cost more. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other services as well, but I've even gone to Customs and Border Protection and demoed to them. They're like, how did you know about those shipments? Because mm -hmm. Customs and Border Protection will seize a shipment alleging labor abuse in the supply chain, but it will be a Chinese company's shipment of, in one case, it was um, hair extensions, right? But they didn't say who who in the United States was buying those or where you could where you could what company had them here in the U.S. And so we were able to use this tool to say that that Chinese company's hair extensions, which were actually human hair from Xinjiang from the hmm. the rehabilitation camps, was being sold in Dallas. And we went to the place, the company that was selling this, these hair extensions, and we found stores around the United States that were selling it. So it's a tracking tool for wow. sure. Yeah. Yeah. If you're interested in trade and supply chains, yeah. That's amazing, yeah. Um, Michael, Katie, what are some other good sources of trade data and what are some things that people need to know about trade data when they actually start to dig uh, into this stuff? Well, um, I would start out with a caution. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's often a lot of emphasis on the trade between two countries. So for example, there's been a lot of focus on trade between the United States and China and some people have cited the trade deficit between the United States and China, but that's actually a very misleading statistic. So I have an account of fact piece with um, Mark Mellitz, who's a professor at Harvard, and we looked at some um, research that showed, for example, with the iPhone 7, so this is kind of dated now, um, but it's very illustrative. With the iPhone 7, it would sell for, you know, at the time, like $650. The import cost was $225 from China. Mm -hmm. But out of those $225, that represented a lot of inputs that um, the Chinese assembly plants imported. And the actual, what economists call value added, the amount that sort of Chinese workers and firms added to the value of that, out of the $225 was $5. Mm -hmm. So these bilateral trade statistics can wildly misrepresent the actual amount of trade because some of that $225 actually represented research and development expenditures from the United States or screens from South Korea or component parts from Vietnam. So I would caution um, about, you know, sort of using some of these data in a way that is not uh, warranted or merited. Would Another, 
Sorry, Sorry go ahead. Uh, well, would, would you recommend if a journalist comes across some of these data like this that they reach out to an expert like yourself and just help them walk, walk through it? Is that is that what you, you would do? Yeah, but you know, this stuff um, is actually, it's very hard to unpack. So, mm -hmm. you know, the reason we did an iPhone 7 and not an iPhone 13 or 14 is because it was based on the work of other economists who spent a long time and a lot of effort trying to figure out where do all these components come from. So it's not, you know, an easy, straightforward sort of answer, but it's something to be concerned with. And just one other thing, you know, this is a very common, um, you hear this a lot, that if we have a trade deficit, that's a bad thing. And the reason is, you know, people think about, well, you know, if I have a business and I have a deficit compared to another company, then I'm not doing so well. But, you know, and, and in fact, in the um, 2016 campaign, the Republicans were saying there's this trade deficit drag and they used, you know, this national income accounting identity that the trade deficit subtracts from national income. But that, you know, it was a really bad argument that made for really good exam questions because it's so wrong. And, you know, you can show that the economy can be doing well or can be doing poorly when the trade account is in surplus or deficit, it doesn't, there's no sort of one-to-one -one relationship. And in fact, not only is this theoretically true, but if you look at the data, it's true as well. So there are a lot of sort of um, facile and wrong ways to think about trade data and the implications of trade statistics. And there, you know, I mean, uh, hopefully Econofact is providing a good resource to journalists, but also the general public to help understand some of these issues. I think the US-Korea, um, so CHORUS, the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement, provides a really good example of what Michael's describing. Um, so I did a trade talks episode on some research on this topic um, with Chad Bown at the Peterson Institute. Um, and then under the Korea-US um, free trade agreement, people noticed that our bilateral trade deficit with South Korea seemed to worsen after um, we we after the agreement went into force. But if you look closer, what you'll see is that um, most of that seemed to be either we were growing faster than South Korea at the time, so demand's going to be growing faster here for all goods, including foreign goods, than it is in South Korea. So that could promote a trade deficit, but that's a purely macro thing. Um, or it was also that we were diverting trade. So once we had no more tariffs levied on goods imported from South Korea, we moved some uh, import demand from China, where we were ordering things from China or from other countries, but especially China, um, to South Korean suppliers. Now, South Korea is a treaty ally, right? Mm -hmm. So that might actually be a, a good thing to see our bilateral trade deficit with them widen in that case, if there's some kind of geopolitical you know, um, interest uh, in, in having the trade agreement too. So I, I think Michael's caution on really Kind of thinking about the nuances and complexities of what these data mean is 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 important yeah uh, well, well yeah and 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 i would i would vouch for other journalists to um definitely talk to people like yourselves because I, it, it it is it is very difficult uh to parse what's what's going on i'm keeping an eye, eye on the time here and i want to get some questions we have some really good ones um katie i'm going to ask you the first one which is um this this might overlap with some of what you were saying before, but what are the good stories about uh, the uh, places or firms or uh, in industries that have been reborn after jobs have gone away? Uh, do we have any good good stories out there to to, to share? So what research shows us, um, so there's a, a very interesting study by Shang Jin Wei and a team of co-authors showing that the services sector really um, has been a big winner from um, trade liberalization and also the the um, opening of China um, into global markets. That the services sector has been able to import um, computers, all kinds of inputs more cheaply, um, and and that that has been um, a winner, so to speak, um, or benefited in particular from these policies. 
research by Rob Feenstra and two teams of co-authors. So there's Feenstra Manju and then Feenstra and Sasahara has shown mm. that exporters in the United States have also benefited a great deal mm. from um, trade liberalization and, and trade agreements, um, even during times when we've had big import shocks. And if you think about it, so uh, and just going back to that steel example, so Lydia Cox has some some uh, really amazing work that she's done on the Bush steel tariffs. And what she finds there is that those steel users who had to pay higher costs under the Bush steel tariffs, they lost market share to Germany, France, other countries for decades afterwards. So um, when we think about trade and access to cheaper inputs, our exporters really benefit from that. In terms of the micro level, uh, I think there are a lot of good individual stories. I, I really love the Sock Queen of Alabama um, mm -hmm. article, again, from the New York Times, just amazing um, reporting there. But then uh, also there are a bunch of examples on the US Department of Commerce uh, International Trade Administration website. Um, mm -hmm. One can reach out to organizations like the National Association of Women Business Owners or the um, the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce also to get other examples of like micro examples of people that one could reach out to to get individual testimonials. The other place that's interesting to hear about micro impacts from trade policies, whether it's tariffs or liberalization, is in the hearings that the US Trade Representative's Office and the US International Trade Commission hold when a new trade policy or agreement is proposed. So if you go to the testimony in those congressional hearings, you see some really fascinating um, stories from business owners and, and industry groups. Yeah, I, I would like to just build on something yes, that Katie sort of alluded to. You know, we're talking about trade and we're all thinking of steel plants or auto plants. But a very big component of U.S. trade is trade in services. So it's like movies, right? Mm -hmm. Or when, in fact, when I have a foreign national sitting in my class, that's like a U.S. export. And so it's important. This goes back to the data as well. When we're thinking about trade, it's not just steel and cars and pineapples, but it's movies and it's education and it's software as well. Um, I guess I'm not sure software is a service or not, but, you know, increasingly service trade is becoming a bigger part of the of the links between countries. And I think those are stories that aren't well understood because perhaps they're a little less obvious than seeing a Toyota uh, in somebody's driveway or, um, you know, or, a, you know, uh, some other good, you know, pineapples or um, orange juice from Brazil. So I think that's a really sort of underreported aspect of all of this um, and something that people should understand better. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Martha, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, this is something, um, you know, what what if you could go back and tell your uh, greener self, so to speak, some things that you know now that you wish you'd known then uh, for journalists who are just getting into like, how do I wrap my head around international trade and supply chains and how things actually end up at the shelves on my local store. Um, you know, what do you, what do you wish that you knew then that you, that you know, know now? Um, it's, it's actually, I, I feel like I'm on opposite day with Mike. It's actually simpler than you think. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I can go out in a strawberry field of, you know, 10 miles from my house and find a child working in the fields, illegal child labor. I can look at the trucks that are sitting there that the strawberries are going into, and I can follow that truck to the processing house. And I can walk in and very politely say, can I see what labels are going onto your strawberries? It's it's that straightforward. Um, this is not to say this is like easy work to do, but it's that I think people kind of feel overwhelmed and like this is going to be impossible. You can never figure this out. Um, but, you know, there's there's been some wonderful journalism over the years. I think um, the Oregonian once followed a potato to a French fry um, and it was yes. just yeah. fantastic. And there's been some others where, um, you know, follow a sweatshirt or something. And so I think the only thing I would say is like 
you know, don't get your hair on fire. <laughs> just <laughs> go step by step and think about, well, who would know? Just keep thinking that. Who would know this? Take it step by step. Don't get yeah. overwhelmed about what the big picture might be. Yeah. Um, another question from the audience I wanted to get to, and I'll just pose this to all of you, whoever wants to answer it. How can we make sure that more women entrepreneurs and business owners who are taking their companies global are featured in the news? Um, and the person says you have to dig deep to under, un, uncover these hidden gems, but they exist. They're there. They start local and they go global. Um, any advice for finding those those folks? Yeah, go, go, go ahead. Uh, not in terms of uh, for finding, because I think that um, I think that we have organizations that can help us find them. But it's just even taking the initiative and it's not just women, but it's also all the other voices that are not being heard of people of color and people from underrepresented communities who are doing amazing things. And um, journalists have to not grab the lowest hanging fruit for their source. They need to be very conscious of that there is a less vocal, perhaps, but just as important and, and more reflective of our society um, group of sources out there to seek out. Mm -hmm. I, I would say one thing, though, um, you know, as a, a research economist, um, you know, I'm interested in data and statistics more than anecdotes, but I think anecdotes are really important. But in some of the work that I did with trade, some of the you know first things I learned was what a low proportion of U.S. manufacturing firms actually export. And it was something along the lines of um, Katie, you could correct me perhaps, but I think it's like 5% or 10%. So, you know, you want to be careful when I would think you want to be careful when you're reporting these, you know, very interesting, compelling stories that you're not sort of making the next step. And therefore, you know, because they might not be representative, even though they hold a lot of interest and, you know, there's really, um, you know, a lot to be learned from it, but there's also a lot not to be learned from it, perhaps. So I think I, uh, yeah, just be I think a that bit you, careful about that. I think that journalists have to contextualize it with with really good data, and we often are turning to the Census Bureau or others to help us with that. Um, just like if there's a murder in my community, <laughs> what does that mean? If there's been a hundred, mm -hmm. that means one thing. If it's the first one in ten years, that means something else. So I think all of these anecdotes definitely need good data to contextualize them, and we're constantly calling people like you, the experts, to tell us, you know, is this even a thing that I've noticed? <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, another question here, I think it's a good one, is the um, so-called trade adjustment, which I believe is uh, something at the federal level where um, the idea is that people who lose jobs due to uh, trade policy um, uh, or, 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 you know, whatever the case may, may be, are re, retrained. Um, do we have evidence on the efficacy of these programs? Do they do they work or or no? No. no. <laughs> I mean, this is, yeah, this is something where, you know, there, there are two issues here. Um, one is that why should we, you know, fetishize trade with this, right? Mm -hmm. So how many typewriter repairmen are there? who kept their jobs or I remember as a kid, you know, you go to a TV repair shop and they'd have all the vacuum tubes, but there's just like a lot of churn in the economy. And why is trade different than other things? Well, clearly there's sort of an us versus them aspect of it, but it's not clear to me that people who for a very wide range of reasons um, lose their jobs or lose opportunities should not be, you know, given the same opportunities. Having said that, these these did not seem to work. And um, when I worked at the U.S. Treasury, you know, we were very interested in that and we sort of puzzled why can't these work better? And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I have a really good answer, but they don't seem to work. The other thing, though, is there is a lot of dynamism in the economy anyway. Um, there's a lot of what's called churn. And so, you know, some of that happens anyway. The problem is if you're a 55-year-old um, person who loses a job in a textile mill um, for whatever reason, for automation, for trade, for whatever reason, you know, that finding another job at that age with your skill set is going to be a real challenge. So I think this speaks to, you know, the need for a robust safety net. 
Um, but Katie, you were going to say something as well. Oh, yeah. Um, just filling in around the edges here. I think one of the reasons it hasn't give that, that uh, trade adjustment assistance hasn't given the results that people hoped is because it's so hard to access. And there's been some great reporting over like, the last decade on just the Byzantine system and how difficult it is to actually get access to it. But in addition, I think that we've really lost sight of how these impacts from say an import surge or uh, you know a really intensive uh, wave of import competition they're they they're very concentrated they're not uniformly spread across the United States they can often disproportionately affect a town with say a large tire plant or or something like that um, and and so I think we really have to consider place-based policy. I know there's been inc an increasing amount of um, reporting lately on administration proposals for industrial policy. If you think about the product cycle I just told you about, you know, there is this sort of secular um, wave of technological innovation continually sweeping through the economy. It's hard to understand exactly how industrial policy aligns with that or what it would mean, but place-based policy, it seems like that should always make sense in some ways, um, because when people start to lose their jobs because a big plant goes down, housing prices fall, there's less money for teachers, so class sizes increase per teacher. Um, just there's the, there are these immense and complex impacts on people's lives. So I think that's something we really need to draw more attention to, and I think it also requires a lot more research in economics. Uh, one more question from the audience that I wanted to get to. Um, let's see. I think the crux of it is that is there a benefit to engaging in trade deals that bring partners along, holding them accountable to improve their labor uh, stand, standards, um, worker treatment, and environmental records? Um, is there a benefit to that? Is that is that possible? That was one of the philosophies behind the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So it mm -hmm. had prohibitions on illegal logging. It had uh, increased protection for workers. Um, you saw the, that Congress intervened to strengthen protection for workers in the renegotiation of NAFTA, now USMCA. So I think there is potential to bring bring uh, you know bring things along in a, a progressive way. At the same time, there's also potential to really uh, codify and entrench some things in the system that we might not like, like or we might like right now, but maybe not in the future. Great. Um, in the last couple of minutes we have, I would uh, appreciate if you could each just maybe look to the future a little bit, next three to five years. Um, you know, what do you see going on now that's going to matter in the short term that, you know, you would want journalists to really be on top of and the news media to be covering? Um, Katie, do you want to do you want to start? Uh, yeah, it builds just on what I what I just said. So yeah. I think a, a really um, underexplored area of trade right now. So so trade agreements are increasingly about what we call non-tariff barriers. Non-tariff barriers can be anything that restricts trade that's not a tariff or quota um, or some kind of tax. So, so think of, say, health standards or um, labeling standards, uh, maximum pesticide residue levels, um, things like this, so standards. And the, stand, the bodies that set these standards globally they're really well understood by private sector interests. They're a lot less understood by the general public, by uh, public health and, and other uh, civil society advocates. I think there's just a lot there. And in fact, I was at UNICEF USA on Tuesday um, explaining about standards setting and how it affects uh, trade in infant formula. Um, but there are many different areas where this is a really big deal. People have no idea. And the lobbying on this is extraordinary. So I've written some papers on this. You can check them out or not, whatever. but uh, I, I think this is completely underexplored and it's going to have, it, it has the potential and, and in some ways already has had a big impact on human health, both in the United States and abroad. Great. Uh, Martha, not to, uh, I don't want you to uh, scoop yourself on anything that you're doing right now, but you know, what do you see? What are the, the, the big uh, 
international trade supply chain stories coming down the pike in the, broad broad terms the cool thing about economists is they can look into the future <laughs> <laughs> they, um, can, in a way that journalists i don't think can mm -hmm. um, at least mm -hmm. i can't i'm always like I, I always find them a tremendous resource because of that ability i don't know i mean i I don't know. I think that the keeping a close eye on what's going on with Russia and sanctions mm -hmm. um, and China rising, but those are very broad topics, not very specific stories at all. Yeah. Michael, what's uh... well? I, I really appreciate Martha's faith and economist's ability to look <laughs> into the future, and I'm not sure I or anybody else share it. Um, you know, there's a um, famous Yogi Berra saying forecasting is really hard especially about the future <laughs> and economists really show that um i think a story that um that we'll see is sort of a movement away from globalization mm -hmm. so there's you know the um the administration is sort of saying friend sourcing right um and you know so katie has a, a nice podcast with me on infant formula and sort of the concerns with that if we have to import it personal um protective equipment you know became very important during the pandemic um there is a great book by uh by my colleague chris miller called chip war which won the financial times um book of the year award and you know he has a a podcast with me as well and um you know there's a lot of sort of fear that these supply chains that martha has been talking about and we've been talking about um, are vulnerable to political, military, um, you know, all sorts of just kind of like disruptions. So I think there's going to be a movement towards that. And I don't think that people necessarily understand the implications of that. So for all of the benefits that we talk about from trade, these are reversed if you're friend sourcing. And so, you know, there are reasons perhaps that when there's a global pandemic, you want to be able to have a national source of personal protective equipment because countries might, you know, sort of close themselves down. On the other hand, you know, for a lot of things, there's going to be a really big cost as that movement goes on. And the other thing to recognize is that when these decisions are made, they're not made in a vacuum, but there's a lot of retaliation. So there's a political aspect to this as well. So I think, you know, going back to what I said at the very beginning, there are real benefits from trade, but often because the benefits are diffuse and the costs are concentrated. These aren't as obvious to people. Um, but if we start to see that there's withdrawal from trade, I think that could become you know, really problematic in ways that become increasingly obvious as the withdrawal increases. Mm -hmm. Well, we are past three o'clock here, so I think we will uh, leave it there, but I hope that we gave everyone a lot to think about. Um, I'm gonna write a piece uh, recapping a lot of what we talked about uh, that will be up on uh, journalistresource.org uh, next week and uh, we're going to post a recording of the uh, podcast or, or the uh, event as well and uh, I just want to thank all the panelists for being here this was really awesome and thank you everyone for listening and joining in and we will see you next time thank you thanks so much thank you thank you